it's my great pleasure today to um, bring to you an uh, a conversation with uh, Dr. David Yench, who is the Empire Innovation Professor of Psychology at Binghamton University that's at the State University of New York. Um, Dr. Yench has had a long history with the journal Psychopharmacology, with at least 11 publications there that I counted, perhaps more, um, including its uh, number 10th most cited paper of all time, um, which was in 1999 with uh, Jane Taylor. Um, welcome, Dr. Yench. Great, thank you for having me. Yeah, so I thought maybe we would start then by um, uh, talking a little bit about that 1999 paper. Obviously, it's made a huge impact on the field. It's been cited a ton of time. And, you know, it's one of my first introductions, actually, to this idea of kind of top-down, bottom-up um, processes in the context of addiction. And I'd love to hear, um, you know, what do you think about this paper 20 years on? What are the things that it kind of you find most important about it? Is there anything that you've changed your opinion about over those years? Well, first off, it was, of all the papers I've written, it was one of the greatest pleasures to write that paper. Um, I was in the final years of my doctoral work at Yale, and I was collaborating with Jane at the time on a number of different projects, both my dissertation projects and work that was going on in her lab. And it was it was such a joy to write because one, I got to write it um, with somebody who was a great mentor and collaborator and friend. Um, and it really was a product that neither one of us could have done on our own. It was the, the melding of our ideas um, onto the page. Um, and it was really during my doctoral work that we began thinking, which was focused on the chemistry of the frontal lobe and how addictive drugs modified the chemistry of the frontal lobe, that we began really thinking from the perspective that you know, these chemical changes in uh, lateral and ventral frontal cortical regions could likely contribute um, to the loss of voluntary inhibitory control over reward-related behaviors, um, which was, I think, in fairness, a fairly novel idea at the time, um, although a couple of groups that's kind of at the same time were coming to similar kinds of conclusions. Um, and so I really also enjoyed the paper because it was uh, not just a listing of the past literature. We really strove to put a new idea out there um, in the in the field. Um, and it was a little scary because there was very little empirical data to sort of directly support or refute <laughs> this concept, um, excepting for some of the work that was coming out of my dissertation. Um, and then it's a joy because it turned out to be over the intervening 20 years, um, just so substantially supported by empirical data and the, the preclinical level, as well as in, um, in, in people who are suffering from substance use disorder. Um, so all of those things make, give me very, very fond memories about the paper, even if it hadn't accrued a lot of, of citations in the intervening years. Um, but I, I think uh, what's happened uh, since then is that the idea that frontal cortical dysfunction is central to the pathophysiolog pathophysiology of substance use disorder, um, as well as potentially other behavioral addictions, um, has really uh, solidified. It's, con it's, it's, it's in virtually every diagram, diagram that um, specifies the relationship between neurobiology and behavior. Um, and so I think, you know, it was, it was you know, it's nice to look back and feel like we contributed to that process in some ways. Um, you know, what, turning the corner, um, it opened, you know, raised more questions than it resolved at the time. Uh, we knew very little about underlying neural mechanisms that eroded frontal cortical function. Um, we knew very little about um, the contribution of individual differences, which we might talk about a little bit later. Um, we knew very little about, um, you know, the functional significance of this um, to relapsing, the relapsing nature of addiction, which is still true today, because we don't have any um, good solid interventions that that really reverse or or re reduce um, the level of frontal cortical dysfunction and addictions, and so without an intervention, it's it's still we're still in the stage where we can't test the causal impact of what would happen if we prevented or or reverse this from occurring. So there's still many many questions um, in the field, but I think it's still a very relevant topic. Absolutely, and and one thing in in rereading that paper. Um, that I noticed was that, um, you know, you'd mentioned that there wasn't a whole lot known about the neural substrates of these kinds of processes, especially at that time. Um, and, and you did have a, a figure in there kind of couching 
some of these concepts, impulsivity and so on, in the context of um, sort of direct and indirect pathways in the basal ganglia, which is something that kind of came out of motor function, par you know, observations to do with Parkinson's disease and things like that. And, um, and I just wondered if you had any comments on that, because, and, and, you know, this is something that I always find my students kind of confused about. I'm not sure what to tell them, like, how are these things, you know, how are these things all coming together, like these motivation functions, decision making, and then, you know, stuff like the motor problems people have in Parkinson's disease. Do you have any comments? Sure. Um, you know, as I said, at the time, we knew very little about um, the neural mechanisms that would contribute to the uh, predicted um, effects that we were talking about in that paper. We did, however, know that um, certain types of manipulations of frontal lobe function, just ab ablation lesions, uh, cytotoxic lesions, and activations, um, tended to across the board, actually, not tended, uh, across the board would, would result in um, dysregulation of subcortical neurotransmission, including dopaminergic modulation of subcortical structures. That was known, and that was part of our hypothesis, was that um, not only were you remover, removing sort of the inhibitory control functions of the frontal cortex, you were also progressively dysregulating subcortical drive, um, including in those systems that are um, less motor and more limbic um, in terms of their functionality, uh, more ventral structures probably. Um, and you know, it is also the case that the parts of the frontal lobe that, that contribute the most to inhibitory control over reward-related behaviors are the ones that project the more ventral you know, ventromedial aspects of the, the basal ganglia and contribute to uh, motivated behavior. So that seems to be a circuit that with, with, you know, the cortical break and the subcortical go kind of built into it. But that distinction I just stipulated is also not really true because what we've learned since um, our paper um, from, you know, pharmacological evidence, but also from evidence from animal, uh, you know, transgenic animals that allow us to manipulate the striatal nigral versus striatal palatal pathways is that the striatal palatal, the D2 regulated striatal palatal pathway seems to play a privileged role in this sort of constraint of behavior. Um, the, you know, the, the flexi flexible inhibition of sort of, of prepotent actions. And so we think that, you know, somehow cortical uh, drive to the, to the ventral medial striatum is interacting with striatal nigral and striatal palatal pathways to optimize sort of you know, the deployment of reward seeking actions versus flexible control over them. Um, and so, and that that's what's getting dysregulated in the, you know, in, in the brain that's being exposed to um, high levels of addictive, potentially addictive substances. Um, so, you know, obviously we, we, a lot, there's been a lot more experimentation since 99 that sort of, that really built a, you know, a better framework to understand these relationships as it's sort of embarrassing to look back into the 90s and realize what we didn't know back then about how the brain functions um, and that we now sort of take for granted <laughs> that we know because of, of technological revolutions and, and also just so much more work going on in the field. Yeah, recurring theme I've noticed is that uh, we don't, uh, we, you learn, the more you learn, the less you realize you know <laughs> in, in both science and in life probably also. Um, another question I had about that paper um, was, I, I was just curious how, how you know some of these concepts um, relate to I guess how impulsivity plays a role in addiction. So you know I, I oftentimes you know people talk about impulsivity playing a role in do you decide to actually try drugs in the first place. So certainly that is that is one of these things you can't really get addicted to drugs if you never try them and and perhaps that could be an impulsive decision at times. And I think some of what you're talking about is also to do with a slightly different aspect of impulsivity in terms of the ongoing process of addiction itself. What does do you decide to Go ahead and take the drug anyway, for example, despite the fact you're trying to quit, et cetera. Could you comment on that a little bit more in, in the context of the you know last 20 years of um, now? So um, you know, my way of thinking is that um, impulsivity or impulsive behavior, proclivity to engage in impulsive behavior, reflects an atypical set of psychological processes that are really the ones that are mo of most importance to us. Um, and I often talk about, you know neurocognitive mechanisms that allow us to exert goal-directed inhibition over our behavior, right? Where our goal is to not do something. Um, and so there are, again, there are these neural mechanisms that support the ability to constrain prepotent or reward-related actions. And that's really um, a, a cognitive mechanism that's 
uh, essential to um, either the expression of or the constraint of impulsive behaviors, and that explains that relationship. Um, I see of the you know, dysfunction and inhibitory control circuitry as having an extraordinarily pervasive relationship with the, the, the processes that underscore, you know, undergird the emergence of addictive behaviors, um, both in terms of initial decisions uh, to engage in, in drug pursuit and consumption, um, eventually to its escalation um, and, uh, and and ultimately to uh, you know failed attempts at abstinence. So now, like, every step of the cycle, I see there being an important contribution from these inhibitory control mechanisms, um, and it's why it, there's evidence to support the idea that um, it it is a, a reasonable predictor of outcome at you know sort of the beginning, middle, and end stages of the of the process of addictions. Um, and so I think that's the kind of the way I think about its relationship um, between the two. And you know, if, if that prediction is true, then it is actually an important set of you know cognitive mechanisms to try to to be able to intervene on. Um, and it's just that there's there are in fact just relatively few tools that have shown definitively that they can do this. Um, either in you know healthy brains or in the brains of people with the substance use disorder. Um, but you know, going back to your question, I think you know when we first put this idea out there, people did have that kind of more you know, I, I would guess they're called folk psychology explanation of the relationship between impulsivity and addiction, which is just what you said that you know people that are impulsive are more likely to pick up the needle to begin with, and that after that, um, you know, maybe nothing else really matters. But it became pretty clear that that was that explanation couldn't hold water because um, when we have uh, gone forward with um, studies of animal models in which um, individuals vary in their level of impulsive behavior or their tendency to engage in um, impulsive behaviors because of either genetic variation or because of manipulations that are made, those animals are also um, at great risk for high levels of self-administration of the drug, right? And including in an environment where they didn't make the choice of the environment that they were in, they didn't make the choice about the drug being available, um, it's there and they can take however much they want. And the fact that animals with high levels of impulsive behavior self-administer with such greater alacrity than do low impulsive animals supports the idea that there's actually a much, a much more, first off, evolutionally conserved relationship between these processes and that the folk psychology account is unlikely to be the real explaining variable. It's something um, more fundamental than that. Um, and, and I think uh, other work that's been done since that paper really supports that idea. Um, you know, I'm thinking in particular of Harriet DeWitt's studies in which she's shown that um, individuals with high levels of impulsivity report higher drug reward in response to fixed dose of amphetamine than do low impulsive individuals. So again, it supports this idea that there's a strong biological explanation for the relationship between the two. And that, um, you know, again, it's, it's evolutionary conserved. It seems to be present from people's first drug experience um, that impulsivity matters in this equation. And then, as I said earlier, I think it just it just continues to matter as they escalate, um, as they develop clinically impairing patterns of use, as they try to attempt make attempts at abstinence and and, and eventually relapse. So I view it as being um, an operating factor. Um, in addiction from beginning to end, and to have more than just sort of a su superficial explanation about what the relationship between the two is. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is this really gets at, I think, one of the key things that perhaps we've been missing a bit in the field in the past is, is this idea of individual differences. So in, in what you were just saying, how it, you know pre-existing differences, genetic or otherwise, um, in impulsivity may have implications for various aspects of the addictive process. Um, and, and even just the, the idea that, you know, most people try drugs and don't get addicted. Uh, this individual difference here is, is really something that we kind of need to explain. Like just um, do you say yes to the person offering you drugs or not is not sufficient to really uh, get at this whole process. And that then gets me into to my next uh, thing I wanted to discuss is this um, something that you've been working on, I think really making a, a big impact on in the field, looking at individual differences and so not just individual differences, but also strain differences within mm -hmm. mouse strains. And I think some of this um, perhaps relates to some of your other work in other species as well. Uh, would you like to say some things on that topic? 
Sure. Um, to be clear, at the time we wrote the 99 paper, and it's written in there, our primary hypothesis was that drug-induced neuroadaptation um, targeted frontal cortical circuitry, and that the impulsivity that we found in associate that would we predicted to be um, in association with addiction was a consequence of drug exposure. That was clearly our thinking at the time. Um, and so Jane and I set out to do a number of you know, empirical studies to try to support that. Um, our first study, we looked at um, how chronic exposure uh, to, to cocaine in vervet monkeys would affect uh, their inhibitory control uh, functionalities. We trained them on a test that's relevant to inhibitory control. Um, we then gave them um, uh, cocaine for two weeks, and then we retested them and found that, in fact, compared to their baseline, there was um, an emergent loss of inhibitory control over their, uh, their reward-seeking actions in this discrimination test. Um, and then we became interested in understanding neurobiologically um, how that emergent inhibitory control problem uh, came to be. And so I was uh, developed another set of studies with my grad student at the time, Stephanie Groman, and my collaborator, Edie London at UCLA. And we wanted to see using neuroimaging um, whether perturbations in dopaminergic transmission in the ventral striatum, again, that was part of our hypothesis about how this uh, impulsive behavior emerged um, uh, would occur after a chronic exposure to methamphetamine. And so we used neuroimaging methods to measure dopamine function, and we used our same behavioral test to look at inhibitory control before, shortly after, or a long time after we gave the animals six weeks of methamphetamine. And what we found is what we predicted, by the way, what the study was designed to test, that we could dysregulate dopamine transmission, we could reduce D2 receptors in the striatum um, as a consequence of methamphetamine exposure, and we could produce this inhibitory control problem. Um, and we actually believed already at the time, based upon some pharmacological evidence, that the D low D2 receptors and, again, the dysfunctional regulation of striatal palatal neurons was potentially a causal mechanism for the emergence of that. But then Stephanie had a realization um, when she was doing an unplanned analysis where she was looking just at the baseline data, the data before anybody got any manipulate drug manipulation. And what she found was that in that baseline data was that there was an extraordinarily strong relationship between the animal's baseline dopamine D2 receptors and their baseline behavior. And those monkeys that had the lowest dopamine D2 receptors even before the drug um, had the poorest inhibitory control. And those monkeys that have the highest um, D2 receptors have the best inhibitory control. So the drug did lessen D2 receptors and it did produce an inhibitory control loss, but there was also this relationship at baseline. And the relationship at baseline from an effect size perspective was an order of magnitude greater than the drug effect. Um, now, it wasn't surprising to me that those differences were there because I had been working with non-human primates for many years and non-human primates, unlike inbred or, or even uh, outbred um, rodents are uh, maximally genetically and phenotypically diverse because of their, again, differences in their genome and their differences in their life experiences. Um, and so uh, these individual differences tend to be much greater in magnitude than they are in our rodent models. Um, and it, but this pattern of results signaled to me that we were on the right track in terms of understanding brain behavior relationships but that we were missing a big factor, which is these individual differences at baseline, um, uh, uh, which suggested, you know, one, that animals like people vary in their inhibitory control over their impulsive behavior, um, that some kind of genetic or environmental factor programs different levels of dopamine receptors and emergent inhibitory control problems, and that maybe we should start turning this whole thing around, and rather than trying to study how the drug changed the brain, we should study how the brain changes the drug <laughs> response. Um, and so that kind of opened my eyes to wanting to explore this more. Um, and it's not that you can't study this in rodent models. It's just that our one has to use a slightly different approach because um, any one line or strain of animals is itself minimally genetically diverse. Um, but there are many different lines and strains of animals that are all, as a population, uh, maximally genetically diverse. Uh, there are hundreds of different inbred lines of mice. There are also certain lines of outbred mice that have been generated to have maximum genetic diversity, like the diversity outbred mice. Um, and so that I, you know, always having, uh, you know, 
uh, research program where I had one foot in non-human primate research and one foot in rodent research, I wanted to figure out whether we could bring um, some powerful and high throughput mouse models to bear on this. And I had a really talented graduate student at the time, Rick Laughlin, who um, had a lot of background knowledge in this area and launched my first experiment to look at sort of, you know, uh, uh, phenotypic diversity and impulsive behavior and drug self-administration and in a large population of inbred mice that were suitable for genetic mapping. So we could actually even find the genomes, uh, the genetic loci that were responsible for their um, variation in impulsivity. And we also, with a talented postdoc in my lab, Catalina Cervantes at the time, were able to not just document and study the genetic basis of uh, individual differences in impulsive behavior. We were able to show this for, for the first time, this prediction, you know, this predicted outcome that those animals that were at high genetic risk for impulsivity were also the greatest self-administering animals, and those that were at low genetic risk were the low were the least. And that leads to a very special kind of conclusion that we that in the behavior genetics we call genetic correlation, which means that two traits are co-varying in a population because they share genetic architecture. Um, and so when it's possible that when Harriet's high impulsive individuals have a high drug response, it's because the same underlying molecular genetic architecture is changing drug reward, subjective reward effects, and impulsive behavior. Um, and so this kind of further supports this idea that there's some kind of really deep biological relationship between these two um, phenotypes um, that explains why they're so you know, interconnected with one another in animals and in people. Absolutely, yeah, that makes a lot of a lot of sense. Um, and even if, by the way, like you know, the mouse genetic variation that relates to high drug taking or compulsive drug taking or whatever is not the same as in humans. Now it becomes a tractable problem. You can study that and you know make hypotheses and prove them correct or incorrect. And and so then let me ask you then another question. So let's say so I have some data from one of your papers looking at a whole bunch of different mouse strains and their responses to to alcohol or ethanol. Um, up behind me here. So let's say that I'm, you know, not a person who wants to do the extremely difficult laborious work that you're showing the data from here behind me. Um, I just want to study alcohol addiction in, in mice. Would you say, should I just get this red strain over here that drinks a ton of alcohol and now I'm studying addiction in mice? Or is that too simplistic a way to think about this? Right. Well, I think um, it's somewhere in between. It, it does, of course, depend upon the question you want to ask. But I think the bottom line is that most of us are using model systems um, for historical reasons because of our training, because we've gotten a lot of data in this use of this particular um, gene this particular uh, genome type, or because um, you know uh, other people in the field are doing that, and so we follow their cue. Um, another reason is because it's just more one's more available than the other, maybe low, lower cost. There's lots, lots of reasons anyway. None of those are scientific, right? And so presumably, if I want to study any phenotype, it doesn't care, matter what phenotype it is, any phenotype under the sun, I want to choose a, a model organism which is optimized for the study of that phenotype, right? Um, so uh, we know, now know from you know 40 years of research uh, that if you take two um, genetic lineages of mice, DBA2J and C57 black 6 j mice, they radically differ in their level of ethanol uh, consumption and preference, and you know, no matter all different and response to all different kinds of assays, and there's been lots of work trying to figure out what that difference is. Um, but just to place this in context, that when we've gone to populations and panels of mice that have expanded genetic diversity, um, so they're even more profoundly uh, diverse than the DBA2J founder and the C57 black 6 j founder contribute to a population. One, you get the predicted effect, which is that more genetic diversity means more phenotypic diversity. You expand the range of the phenotype that you're interested in. And you happen to encounter um, lines of subject that show more extreme um, uh, levels of that phenotype. And that may, to, to answer your question, that might be exactly what you want um, in a study, right? Um, so we know that there's, you know, many years of research and many, so many countless numbers of papers that say that the C57 black 6J mouse is the ideal model for studying binge alcohol consumption. Um, but as a result of this study, we also learned that the PWK PHJ mouse, which is a wild-derived strain, 
um, routinely drink, drinks um, and, con and prefers alcohol um, in, to levels that are far beyond the 6J mouse. Um, and so again, that might be a, a good cause to want to study that subject instead of the 6J mouse or alongside the 6J mouse as we did in this particular study. Another thing that was really interesting about that, and it's hard to see if, um, unless you go to the paper and look at that particular panel, uh, it wasn't just that the uh, PWK mice have more extreme levels of drinking, they also have an extreme sex difference. Um, the sex difference in ethanol consumption and preference is almost qualitative. I can almost tell you what the animal's sex is by biological sex is by knowing how much they drank. Um, and one of the things we have found subsequently um, is that across strains, um, you find different patterns of sex differences. There isn't a sex difference. There's a, a, a genotype moderated uh, sex different set of sex differences. And the reason that happens, we've learned since, is because background genetics reshuffles the contribution of the sex, the three major sex biasing factors to behavior. So in some lines, sex chromosome complement matters a lot. Um, as recent papers support for um, alcohol consumption in the black 6J mouse. In other mice, like the um, PWK mouse, it appears to be entirely, the sex difference is entirely due to gonadal secretions and, and very little to do with sex chromosome complement. So background genetics is sort of pushing different sex biasing factors to the front, which is producing this varying pattern of sex differences. I think that's really important because we want to know that sex our observations about sex differences generalize. And if we only study one line of mice or one species, something, we're not necessarily gonna find a generalizable sex difference. So that's a cautionary note there. Um, and so just as an interesting aside, um, you know, the, the goal of the production of that panel of mice was to, again, introduce maximal genetic diversity. Um, and the way that they did this was to introduce um, five, they did an advanced intercross between five common laboratory inbred strains and three what are called wild derived strains, right? So you know probably that most laboratory mice we use today um, made their way into CC Little's lab from um, the pet trade, the fancy mouse trade. And so there were people who were breeding mice because they had fancy fur and fancy colors, and they, uh, but they were also selectively breeding them because they kept them in their homes. And so they didn't like mice that were mean and they didn't like mice that try to escape all the time and, and do bad stuff. And they didn't like mice that killed each other like mice in the real world do. So they selectively bred them and domesticated them um, to the point that you can you know, walk around with a C57 black 6J mouse in your hand and it, it, it just sits there and it doesn't run and it doesn't bite in general. Um, so they did a lot of selective breeding and the wild derived strains are not selectively bred and they do behave wildly. Um, so they do attack and they do try to get away and they you put them on a plus maze and they run away, all the kind of things you expect a wild mouse to do. Um, and I started to think, is it the PWK PHJ is one of these um, wild derived strains? And I was started thinking to myself, um, is that distinction relevant? Like, is it is it something about it being the wild derived strain versus being the common lab strains that explained its high alcohol drinking behavior? And at least one hypothesis that I think actually holds some water um, is that you know, in humans, aggressive behaviors and alcohol have a long recognized relationship with one another. People get mean when they drink. Some people get particularly mean when they get drunk. Um, and in fact, um, uh, one of my former postdocs during her dissertation work showed in hamsters this strong relationship between impulsivity and aggression and drug reinforcement. And so I started to think that the process of domestication, that by removing the genotypes that produce aggression um, and, the, and some other wild characteristics of mice, actually also removed some of the, character, uh, the genotypes that maybe promote drinking. And it's why I think, I hypothesize, one of the reasons that our rodent models drinks, we're always confused, why don't they drink more? Why don't they drink more? They, I mean, they don't drink until they, they, get, they get drunk. Um, I think the process of, of inbreeding and domestication of mice uh, probably contributed in some ways to this. And that, that it's not a random chance that it's the wild derived strain that drinks the most. It's because it was allowed to retain its, its characteristics, including its tendency to be mean. Interesting. I wonder then how you think um, 
obviously you're you're a person who who is doing a lot of this research with interest in understanding ultimately human brains and disorders and things like that. Um, I mean, are we sort of like an outbred species, a wild type species of this type that maybe like these um, PWK uh, PHJ mice, or, or are we sort of self-domesticated, or like how do you think we fall into this um, in, in in terms of that kind of an analogy? Right. As a well, I think that in, in order to understand um, us as a species better, we have to use um, these highly genetically and, and, and life experience diverse models um, because we, you know, the human species is a mess um, from all kinds of perspectives. Um, so I do think we have to, I, I think these populations with maximal diversity uh, where there's huge individual differences, just at face, the face valid level um, are in fact more like us, right? Um, and so it's, you know, you can get to the question whether they're, they, they, we respectively vary um, in the same ways. That becomes another deeper question, more construct kind of question. And I would suggest that we do because, you know, after our um, observation that there was this, uh, there was something about earlier where there's a strong relationship between D2 receptor abundance at baseline, which we now know to be abundance, we, although we measured it with, neuro, with neuroimaging, it, it does seem to be the density of D2 receptors that's, uh, that's uh, we're being are being measured that um, high density of D2 receptors produces good inhibitory control and vice versa. One we st we studying the mouse population found the same a, a genetically diverse mouse population found the same relationship. Um, you know the the Cambridge group using outbred rats found the same relationship, and ultimately um, a number of labs, David Zald's lab, Ed London's lab, has found the same exact relationship in people, right? People mice, rats, monkeys that have low D2 receptors are more impulsive and have poorer inhibitory control. This suggests that the ways in which we vary are identical, at least at this level, at least for this particular phenotype. Um, and so it's not just that we, you know, I mean, it's, it's nice that we have a population um, that's usable in the preclinical lab that varies at face value in the same ways that we do, but it seems to be that they vary because of the same things as we do. And, and, if, you, and if, if that's believable to you, and I, I would actually argue that the relationship between D2 receptors and impulsive behavior is arguably the most reproducible brain uh, behavioral to molecular association we have in the literature. Um, and to, from, a, from a biomarker perspective, it's a strong re reproducible biomarker for impulsive behavior. Um, if you believe that, then um, there's every reason to bring all of these approaches together um, to sort of synergize to figure out what's, um, you know, what, what are the cellular and circuitry and molecular and processes that are associated with this relationship. And then again, in the human, what the consequences of that relationship are um, for ongoing addictive behaviors and whether it, it's a site of, of you know, intervention that can affect the outcome, which again remains an, an undetermined question. But, all of this supports the idea of putting those resources under and to trying to figure this out better. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's it's very clear. I think this kind of work really demonstrates that there's there's huge amounts of diversity in both the population we're trying to study, humans, as well as our animal models. And if we're not um, embracing that, we're we're missing part of the story here. We're missing, um, you know, we're arguably perhaps studying a um, population that doesn't have a whole lot to, it's an internally consistent biological organism, like a C57 black six mouse, but it's sort of not something that really exists in the world. It's not kind of varying in a lot of the ways that are hugely important probably to understanding our psychiatric disorders in humans, I'd say. So, so thank you for doing that work. Um, I'd also, you know, kind of argue that, um, that, that this kind of diversity needs to not just be in our animal models, but also probably in our labs themselves as well since this kind of you know, diversity of thought, diversity of people's backgrounds, where they're coming at and asking these kinds of questions, I think this has been one of the things for potentially holding us back as well as a, as a field. No, I mean, I think there's, there's literally no question that that's true. And it's, it's perplexing to me that in light of the overwhelming empirical data um, that human diversity in our workplaces promotes cre more creative, uh, more innovative work pro and more effective work products. Um, it's it's surprising that it's 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 still difficult to convince people to to put their time and their resources and their effort into into sort of turning a corner in terms of the demographics of of our academic institutions. Um, 
but you know, I think at, at, at every level, um, we should be focused on this. And I should say, I don't, you know, I, I'm so may come across sometimes as being critical of the lack of diversity in our animal populations and animal research. But I want to be clear: um, human research ha has an equally big problem, on which you know all, most of psychology and neuroscience is the psychology and neuroscience of mostly white, very relatively well-off college students who live in the Western world. Um, and we don't understand very much about how psychological principles and neuroscientific observations um, operate in, in, uh, in diverse populations. And, you know, I, you know, so there's, there's plenty of, of, of error and plenty of room for criticism at multiple angles. Um, um, in, in our, in our uh, academic institutions. And I do think we need to be, you know, highly focused on all of these co different components, the people doing the work, the people that we're studying, the animals that we're studying, and then ultimately um, the, the groups that benefit from research, um, you know, uh, have historically been also a relatively small a segment of the population. And so we, we need to, you know, be increased. I, I think it's just important for us all to be you know, focused on this. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's, uh, you know, the case that we have a lot more work to do here. But, um, but I would like to thank you for, for making these, you know, doing these really difficult experiments that I think kind of make us all consider these issues, even if we're not necessarily doing it in any given experiment, we're using our little inbred strain or whatever. You know, this is something that is now out there, we are having to sort of confront in our research and and, and hopefully make things better in, as, as we go forward as a field. So I thank you for, for your important contributions there. And I'd also like to thank you just more generally for, for doing this interview. It's been really fun to talk to you. I feel like you know there's three other topics we didn't get a chance to talk to at all. So perhaps I'll have to invite you back at some point um, to, to have another conversation. But, but I do really appreciate your time, Dr. Yench. Um, and, and thank you again for, for, uh, for being here today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me. And I just like to pass, you know, close with one note, which is, you know, these these even when I started doing this work, I found it to be intimidating um, and you know difficult to wrap my my brain around doing studies of this scope. But I like to say to people, if I can do it, you can do it too. Um, there's nothing special about my laboratory. There, I have had some very talented people, but so do you. Um, and if I can do this work, so can you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I really appreciate your time. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye.